You can, y'all can see what happened here earlier. Huh? Well, I just tore it off now. I can give you a hundred. Which actually, numbers. you can still use that. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, I'll take the bank and exchange it. But you're right, I can't use it. Most stores probably wouldn't take it. Well, we're going we're gonna to test this one and see if it's counterfeit. Counterfeiting going on here. It's just a part of the story. Okay, but. Oh, dang it. Wow. That was... <laughs> so, what happened to that other dollar? Oh, yeah. uh, well, um, we just had an accident with it. That's all. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, since we're starting to talk about solutions, let's talk about the solution I used on the dollar bill that, uh, for this demonstration we just did, okay? So all this is, somebody said this was a mixture of alcohol and water. That is, in fact, what it is. This is the same kind of alcohol you can buy in the grocery store, the drugstore, Walmart, Target. It's called isopropyl alcohol. So uh, isopropyl alcohol is kind of a common name for an alcohol that you learned to name when we were in Unit 4. Okay? Four fingers, four. Um, and if I ask you to write the formula for... Uh, Propane 2-all, you would have the formula for isopropyl alcohol. <coughs> propane 2-all, propane 2-all. You did write down this in your lab notebook because this was a demonstration, right? You need to have your observations in your lab notebook, right? Every time we do a demonstration? Okay. Yeah, I didn't know. I know. I was fooling you. Why not? So I, I'll give you a chance to do that now. But this is, this is isopropyl alcohol. It's stuff you buy in the grocery store, drugstore. Walmart, Target, so forth. But uh, we learned to name it in Unit 4 as propane to all. Okay, so what happens with our demonstration with the dollar bill is that in order to keep it from actually burning, okay, um, the water that's in here, and isopropyl alcohol, when you buy it in the grocery store, the drugstore, or something, uh, it comes in either one, either either of one, one of two different concentrations. It comes in 71%, I'm sorry, 70% or 91%. And the percent refers to the percent by weight of the alcohol dissolved in the water, okay? So 71% isopropyl alcohol is 71% isopropyl alcohol and 29% water. 91% uh, is 91% isopropyl alcohol and only 9% water. Well, that's rubbing alcohol. So you rub it. You actually rub it on your skin to cool it down before when you got muscle damage. That's what that's where the name comes from. I don't do that anymore much, but that's what it's for. So um, the water in here, the isopropyl alcohol burns at a fairly low ignition temperature. Dollar bills are made of a uh, type of paper that's actually come bring, comes from rags. It comes, it's, it's fabric, okay? And so it has a relatively high ignition temperature. It also has an ink on it that never completely dries. And that also keeps it from burning. And so the combination of those two ha makes it means the dollar bill doesn't burn until you get it at a, at a higher temperature than regular paper. So if I were to photocopy a dollar bill on a piece of paper and try to pass it off as a dollar bill, it would burn through this. It would burn and not, um, and not do, do the, uh, be able to do the activity we talked about. But the water in here has a really, really high heat capacity. When we get to Unit 10, we'll be talking about heat capacities. 
And what I mean by heat capacity is it absorbs an awful lot of heat, okay, before it changes temperature or to get it to change one degree temperature, it absorbs a lot of heat. So when you change the temperature a long way, it's, it's absorbing a lot of heat. More than that, when it boils away, and it does in this demonstration boil away, you just can't see it doing that, it's doing it. Um, the heat absorbed when, in changing it from a liquid to a gas is way high, much higher than just the heat, capa heat capacity. And we'll talk about that again when we get to unit 10. But the combination of those two things means when I light the isopropyl alcohol on fire because it's more volatile, it's turning into a gas on the, along the surface of this dollar bill, I put the flame to it, it's the isopropyl alcohol gaseous molecules that are catching on fire. It's heating up the water alcohol solution, causing more of the isopropyl alcohol uh, molecules to, uh, to become a gas and burn. But the water, because it absorbs so much heat before it ever heats up and so much more heat when it changes from liquid to gas, uh, the water is actually preventing the temperature from rising high enough on the dollar bill to burn. That all makes sense? There's a lot, going, a lot of chemistry going on there. Okay, now... This is a solution, and what's what we're talking about today? We're starting to talk about solutions, all right? Most of our unit we're about to begin is about solutions. And you've been taught about something called a homogeneous mixture in previous classes, right? Can anybody remember a definition for a homogeneous mixture? They become one, okay? Actually, you can separate them. Uh, and they're not entirely one. That's a pretty good definition, okay? They're, they're mixed at such a small or tiny level that you have to use some chem chemical process to separate them. That's a true solution and a true homogeneous mixture. For a chemist, you have to get it. It has to be a solution to be a true uh, homogeneous mixture. Only solutions are true homogeneous mixtures, okay? You with me so far? All right. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of this. All right, we're talking about mixtures today then to begin our understanding of solutions because a solution is a mixture. Okay, so we said that the only truly homogeneous mixture is a solution. But there are, you know from previous classes, there are two major classes of mixtures. There's heterogeneous and homogeneous. And if it's homogeneous, it's a solution. Okay, in chemistry, the only true homogeneous mixture is a solution. Everything else is heterogeneous. Okay, <clears throat> so in a homogeneous mixture, all the substances are evenly distributed throughout the mixture. Okay, but if, that, if that's all you knew about a homogeneous mixture, you wouldn't understand what it means to a chemist. Uh, evenly distributed to a chemist means evenly distributed down to the molecular level. Okay? Down to the molecular level. Which means about or approximately the nanometer level. Okay? It's down to the nanometer level. Alright, and there's some examples here. Salt water. When you dissolve salt in water, you've got water molecules and you've got sodium ions and chloride ions interspersed evenly amongst all those water molecules, okay? In air, we've got different gases in air. You've got mostly nitrogen, you've got some oxygen and carbon dioxide, water vapor, some other gases in there, and they're all evenly mixed together, and all of those are individual molecules of air, all evenly mixed together. And then blood, and I, actually I probably should take blood off there, because blood is not really a solution, okay? Blood is actually something else called a colloid. Okay, we'll take that off of there, okay? <clears throat> we'll talk about that colloid in a minute. Now, uh, a heterogeneous mixture then would include blood, because guess what? Blood is not a solution. It's a colloid we'll talk about shortly, okay? And so this means the particles or substances are not evenly distributed. But when we say not evenly distributed, it means that some part of it the part that's kind of getting put into the larger part, the smaller part being put into the larger part, that smaller part um, has chunks that are larger than a nanometer, roughly speaking. Now, we have to be careful about those size designations because 
when we talk about size particles here, that's a, a general idea. It's not specific. Okay? What matters is the behavior, not the size. Size doesn't matter. Behavior matters. You with me? Size doesn't matter. Behavior matters. But in general, almost all those mixtures that behave like solutions will have particles mixed at the nanometer or smaller level. Does that make sense? So it's a good generality, but it's not an exact thing. So the example of a chocolate chip cookie. Well, you know, the chocolate chips, that's clearly not mixed evenly, is it? In a chocolate chip cookie. Because of chocolate chip ice cream, which I kind of like better than chocolate chip cookies. That's all right. Okay. Anyway. Um, but that's, pre that's a pretty big chunk here. All right? I wouldn't even call that a colloid or a suspension. I'd call that a coarse, C-O-A-R-S-E, coarse mixture. If the particles that are mixed together are large enough to be physically with like really tiny tweezers or something separated, that's a coarse mixture. Okay, that's way bigger particles than even a colloid or a, or a uh, suspension. All right? No. Coarse like a class is C-O-U-R-S-E. Coarse like uh, really rough or, or big chunks is C-O-A-R-S-E. Okay? And, I'm, and the example of a pizza, that's a visual example, okay? That's like, you know, on the, on the pizza you got chunks of uh, ham and you got pepperoni and you got pieces of tomato sometimes. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's kind of an example that's a little bit almost off the chart, so to speak, okay? It's a coarse mixture. You with me? All right. So then, suspensions. So um, the example of a suspension that we have here of a chocolate milk, here's what I want you to imagine. This is not store-bought, off-the-shelf, in the dairy section chocolate milk, okay? This is the chocolate milk, yeah, you stir up at home. You take Hershey's syrup or Nestle's Quick, and you stir it up, right? Well, here's the question. When you sit it on the counter after stirring it up, no matter how well you stirred it up and you leave it sitting, what does it do? This separates out. The cocoa settles to the bottom. That is what suspensions tend. Okay, so if you leave it sitting, it'll settle. We've done a lab where you've seen this process. Y'all remember doing that? Yeah, because you just did it. You, you just made it up here, right? Yeah. So it's, oh, you weren't thinking about that one? Okay. So it's, uh, we, we put uh, lead, lead to um, nitrate. To get so a solution of lead to nitrate together, and that was a true solution. It was lead to nitrate ions mixed up in water, and you have potassium iodide, true solution, potassium and iodide ions distributed in water, dissolved in water, and you put those together, and it formed a a solid material. Well, at first it was all just nice and yellow and all thick and stuff, and it if you left it sitting, which we did, it settled to the bottom, right? Well, it also we were able to Filter them out, weren't we? Which is the other part of being able to determine if you have a solution, I mean a uh, suspension. So if you're trying to test a mixture to see if it's a suspension, this is a test. Leave it sitting. If it settles, it's a suspension. If, if, you, if you filter it out and you filter out the particles, it's a suspension. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay? And this size, again, is sort of relative. In some literature, they use the particle size of being two nanometers. Okay, so a dispersed particle of two nanometers or larger would make it a suspension. But some literature says the particles have to be a thousand nanometers. So it's kind of relative. It has to do with what, how the particles interact and the behavior as to whether it's a true suspension. You with me? If the particles that are uh, mixed together are highly attracted to each other, you might need the particles to be a thousand nanometers before you can get them to settle out. But if they're not highly attracted together, you might be able to get them to settle out when they're only 200 nanometers. Does that make sense? So it's behavior that determines whether you have a suspension.
Okay, so this is a called a polydensity bottle. And so this is not a regular water bottle. Well, that's a water bottle, yeah, but we got other stuff in there. We don't have, you know, just tap water you can drink or something in there, right? So, um, and what you have in here is you've got a clear liquid in the top and a clear liquid in the bottom and two layers of beads here. And you make really good observations of what all that looks like. You know, put that in your lab log book. And then you shake it up and see what happens. And I'm sure you can tell that when you shake it up, well, now the beads separate and the white beads go to the top and the blue beads go at the bottom when they were originally both in the middle. Okay, and then if you leave it sitting for a while, you'll watch them come back to the, the center again. Now, after you finish writing all your observations of all of this, okay, careful observations of what's going on, I want you to go back through your notes you just took about solutions and colloids and suspensions and coarse mixtures and all that kind of stuff, and I want you to describe what happened using those terms, okay? See if you can explain what happens using some or all of those terms terms, okay? In your lab log book, yes. You can, you can also use other terms to describe what's going on, but use those terms as much as you can to describe uh, not only what you see, but what you think is causing it, okay? If you think it's a solution, or if you think it's a suspension, or you think it's a colloid, you've got to be able to sort of justify that, that description. Does that make sense? I mean, if it's mixed, it's, all, it's a mixture, right. But we're talking about the parts of the, the different types of mixtures that we call coarse mixtures and suspensions and colloids and solutions. All right, let's discuss a little bit, guys. So using the terminology we've just been discussing today, uh, what do you think is going on here? What's inside the bottle? Yes. So the, so, so the beads are a coarse mixture. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, over <laughs> yeah clearly over 200 nanometers, right. Uh, so it's a suspension or a coarse mixture, okay. What about what happens when you shake it up? What do you get then? Um, you think it's heterogeneous? So is it, if it's heterogeneous and not homogeneous, is it a colloid, suspension, or coarse mixture? Just the liquid parts now, not the bead part. You think it's a suspension? What evidence do you have that this was a suspension when you shook it up? Oh, you're saying so that because you saw the beads move the way they move, you're making an assumption then the, and so you have to be careful about assumptions, but you're making an assumption then that the two parts mix together and then separate it out. Is that what you're saying? Two different, two different liquids. No, you're saying no. Okay, yeah. Okay, so she's arguing that the one on the bottom looks a little less clear. Some of them look pretty clear, and some look a little less clear, okay? All right. So that would be an indication you have two different... Um, Liquids, maybe. Okay. All right. So, let me explain to you what is going on. And yes, Tim, density is part of the problem, part of the, the th what's going on here. We have three um, different things in the liquid part. Okay. You've got isopropyl alcohol and water and table salt. In the liquid part, you've got isopropyl alcohol which we call propane 2 all and we have water and we have table salt. Now, I told you when we were in unit 7 that all that stuff about particles being attracted together and the strength of attraction was going to come back again in this unit and this is what this is about. What we have is we have table salt in here which is charged particles. You have a charged sodium ion and a charged chlorine ion. You've got water, which is highly polar. And then you've got isopropyl alcohol, which, while it's polar, it's not as polar as water is. Okay, you with me? Mm -hmm. Given those three descriptions, 
uh, which of the two liquids, the water or the isopropyl alcohol, will the table salt want to dissolve in? The water. The water. Because it's more polar. And the uh, so sodium and chloride ions are completely charged. So they're going to seek to be attracted to the things that's most highly charged, and the water has the greatest polarity. Okay, a partially positive, partially, partially negative end on that water molecule, right? Okay. So what's happening in here is the salt is selectively dissolving in the water. It's choosing to go to the water because the water is more polar, which creates a more dense solution that goes to the bottom, and the isopropyl alcohol rises to the top because it's less dense. And the beads are between the two densities. The beads have a density that's between the density of the salt water at the bottom and the isopropyl alcohol at the top. But the cool part is when you shake it up, the mixture of the salt water and isopropyl alcohol has a density in between the density of the white beads and the blue beads. So you've got one, two, three, four, five different densities going on here. Okay, the white beads have a density, the blue beads have a slightly greater density, the isopropyl alcohol has a, uh, the lightest density of all. The salt water has the greatest density, and the mixture of the salt water and the isopropyl alcohol has a density in between the densities of everything else, between the white beads and the blue beads, and between the uh, isopropyl alcohol and the salt water. Got all that? And when, when you get to this point right here where you can see the isopropyl alcohol, white beads, mixture, blue beads, and a salt water, you can see the, the five densities here. All right, so let's talk about the concentration units of solutions now. So most of our math work in this uh, unit will be about the math involving solutions. We don't really do any math with colloids and suspensions. All of our math work in this unit will be about solutions. And we have three different concentration units for solutions. Percent concentration, okay, percent concentration, which is the percent uh, you, you, you take the mass of the, of the thing being dissolved, the solute, and divide by the mass of everything, and multiply by 100, you have a percent concentration. Now, percent concentrations, unless the concentration units are told to you, they will be mass percents, okay? So if it just says 95%, then it is a reasonable assumption that it's 5% solute to 100% solution. Okay, 5%, and then that, that would mean that you'd have a, a 95, uh, let's say 5%, or 5 grams of, if you were to break it out to 100 grams of, of solution, you'd have 5 grams of solute, 95 grams of solvent for 100, 100 grams of solution. Okay, now, molarity, it's also referred to as a molar concentration. So molarity refers to the concentration. Molar concentration usually is used similarly, but more leaning toward saying that a, a, uh, a solution has a molar concentration of. Okay? So they're, they're kind of used interchangeably. Molar concentration is moles of solute divided by liters of the solution. Remember, solute and solvent together make up the solution. So you've got solute, you've got solvent, and together the solute and solvent make up the solution. And the last concentration unit is molality. So these are spelled very similarly. They sound very similar. You have to be very careful in your pronunciation and spelling. Molality is moles of solute divided by kilograms of solvent. Not solution, but solvent. Okay? Um, and this is moles per kilogram. When you get it done, a, a, a unit of molal concentration is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. This last unit, molality, is the one that you'll need to be able to get a good grasp of for the ice cream lab. We'll do in unit 10. Last lab we'll do in here. Okay? So you don't get to eat ice cream unless you can do the math. So you've got to get good doing the concentrations of molality. 
but the most often used unit of concentration in a lab is molarity. More often than any other concentration unit, molarity is used in the lab. Now, percent concentration you find a lot in retail businesses, okay? So, for example, isopropyl alcohol is sold in 71%, I'm sorry, 70% and 91% concentrations. So you'll see percents used a lot in the grocery store and the drug store and Walmart and department stores like that and Target and so forth, okay? All right, so moles of solute, liters of solution is molarity. Moles of solute, kilograms of solvent is molality, okay, or molar concentration and molal concentration, okay? All right, what do you say? Let's try and do a little math then, okay? Well, whether you want to or not, like they say, you know, with that, what is that uh, movie? Your, your mission, whether you choose to accept it or not, or something like that. All right, here's your problem. We have 10 grams of table salt and 100, that's 10.0 grams of table salt, and 100.0 milliliters of solution. Question is, what is the molar concentration? Now, I know most of the time when we get to this point in our instruction, I do an example with you. But you already know how to do all this math. You know how to find moles from math, from mass, and you know how to convert from one unit of measurement uh, to another within uh, the SI system of units. So you should be able to convert milliliters to liters and then put them together to find the mol molarity. So that's the only thing new here is you know it's molarity, but I'm telling you it's moles over liters, so figure out how to find the moles, find the moles, figure out how to find the liters, find the liters, and then put them together. All right, so let's talk about how to solve this problem then. All right, the way you've been taught to solve these kind of problems all year long, or at least in my class they've been taught that way, is to start with your starting amount over 1. And that's what we're going to do here, starting amount over 1. And what we have to do is just simply convert that then uh, using dimensional analysis to moles. So we're going to go from grams to moles. For that, we need molar mass. So we're going to calculate molar mass. And right here is where we're calculating molar mass. Molar mass is defined as the sum of all the atomic masses of all the atoms in a formula written in units of grams. So we've added up the atomic masses of both sodium and chlorine. We get this 58.44 grams. Now, in my class, I also require students to finish an equality statement at the end of their calculation of molar mass. So it's 58.44 grams of sodium chloride equals one mole of sodium chloride. So it's always the uh, mass they calculate in grams of that species equals one mole of that species, always equal to one mole of whatever species they're calculating the molar mass for. Using this equality statement, that's just the equals part here, right here, this equals this, we build a conversion unit. We're going to match the starting units of grams and the starting species of NaCl with the side of this equality statement that has the same kind of units and species and put that on the bottom. So this 58.44 grams of NaCl goes in the bottom because I have grams of NaCl on top here. That allows me to cancel grams and cancel chlorine. Now the other side of the equality statement, one mole, goes in the top. You do the math, this number divided by that number, and you get this. You underline all the insignificant digits. Since of all, all the measured and calculated numbers in the problem, this first number has only three digits. We want our final answer to have that same number. So we underline all the insignificant digits. Leading zeros are never significant. Underlining all these digits starting with the second one here. And by the way, we keep the units of moles and sodium chloride here. Draw an arrow to show we're rounding off and write the answer we have. That's just the moles. That's the one that goes on the top here. Moles of solute over liters of solution is what molar concentration is. Okay? All right, that's, where, that's the first stage. The second stage, then, is to find out how many liters there are in a milliliter solution. Now, I know you could use some sort of King Henry thing that moves the decimal places around and stuff, but I don't let students do that in my class. I want them to actually show me the dimensional analysis. 
So we know that there are 1,000 milliliters in one liter. We start with the 100.0 milliliters of solution, and we need to be clear that it's an NaCl solution here, okay, because later on in the unit, it's going to matter uh, which solution you're talking about. When you're working with more than one solution in a problem, you need to keep up with which one applies to which math you're doing or what part of the math you're doing. So it's 100 milliliters of NaCl solution over 1. Again, putting the starting amount over 1 times a conversion unit built from this equality statement. The 1,000 milliliters goes in the bottom here because it matches the milliliters I have in the top here. That allows me to cancel milliliters. The other side of the equality statement here goes on the top of this fraction. I cancel out milliliters. I'm left with liters of NaCl solution. And when I do the math, 100.0 divided by 1,000 gives me 0 .0, 0 .1, 0 0.1000 liters of solution of NaCl solution. Now, uh, we now have liters of solution. We have moles of sol solute. So I've got moles of solute, liters of solution. I just need to put this over this, as I've done here, to get the final answer. And we have units of moles over liters of NaCl solution. Since by definition, moles over liters, or moles of solute over liters of solution, is molarity, or molar concentration, I can simply write this moles per liter as a capital M, a capital M with a line under it. All right, now we can do all of that uh, as one big problem down here. And I'm sorry, I kind of have this part off the screen down here. So here's where we put the two parts together. Here's the answer. There's the moles per liter. We changed it into um, molarity here, a mol molar concentration. I can do all that as three, one, two, three, three problems, or I can do it as one problem. Okay? So I can take just this first two steps here and put it into this part of the problem here. Uh, I need to put the answer I get here over liters of solution, which is what I did down here. To do that, I need to start with 100 milliliters of solution on the bottom. So this is one case where we put the, um, a, a what could be considered a starting amount under one. It's only when I need the final answer to have that volume on the bottom. So by putting it under one, using the conversion unit, conversion unit in this fashion, where milliliters cancel, I end up with moles per liter down here. And I end up, when I do the rounding and everything, with the same answer as I did when I did the, the first time up here. I came up with this answer, same answer here. 